Good morning. I hereby call to order this 11th meeting of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission for the year 2023. Welcome to everyone here with us and who are watching on the live stream. We ask you to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. You have made you've made notice a few changes here on the bench this morning. First, I'm honored to be your new chairman. Our former chairman, Gladys Brown Dutrail, who is here with us today in the audience, left some big shoes to fill. But I am humbled by this new role. I would like to thank Governor Shapiro for this appointment. I appreciate his confidence and faith in me as we move this commission into the next chapter. I look forward to working with my fellow commissioners and the dedicated staff at, at, at the commission in this new capacity. I wish I could be with you today in the uh, in the room um, for my first meeting. Unfortunately, I tested positive for COVID over the weekend, so I am uh, ending my isolation uh, today. I look forward to being in the room with you for our October meeting. I would also like to welcome Commissioner Barrow who was confirmed on August 30th by the State Senate. I also congratulate her on her recent election as the commission's new vice chair. She was elected by myself and our fellow commissioners during a recent special executive session. As many of you know, she most recently served as the chief of staff for our former chairman and has been involved in utility regulation for more than two decades. Vice Chair Barrow, would you like to make a few comments? Thank you, Chairman DeFrank. Um, I am truly honored to take this position and I look forward to the work. I just wanna take an opportunity to introduce my staff, my team, um, many of whom you already know, Diane Anchef, Chris, Christian McDowell, Lori Moore, and Festus Odubo. Thank you. Thank you. Also in the audience today attending her first official public meeting in the role as executive director is Jennifer Barrier. Jennifer has hit the ground running as we all knew she would. At today's meeting, which is open to the public, the commission will act on various matters. There is no opportunity for the public to address the commission at this public meeting. The public meeting motions, statements, and video will be available on the commission's website later today. The first matter on this morning's agenda are the approval of the minutes of the meeting of August 3rd, 2000, 2023. I would like to recognize Commissioner Yonora as the editor of the minutes. Commissioner Yonora. Chairman, I have reviewed the minutes of the August 3rd, 2023 public meeting and moved that be, be approved and submitted. Thank you. We have heard the motion by Commissioner Yonora. Is there a second? Second, Barrow. Motion made by Commissioner Yonora, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary, we are ready for your presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, and welcome Vice Chair Barrow to the bench. Your various bureaus and offices have prepared the following agenda for your consideration. Therefore, let us begin on page one with matters presented by Director Monahan and the Bureau of Audits. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the 2023 Management Efficiency Investigation Report of the Duquesne Light Company and make the report and the 2023 Implementation Plan public. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved, surface. Is there a second? Coleman, second. Motion made by Commissioner Zerfis, seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing on page one, it is recommended that the annual report of management audits and management efficiency investigations be made public. 
Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? You know, so moved. Is there a second? Second, Barrow. Motion made by Commissioner Unora, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any discussion? I do have a statement in this matter. I ask that my statement be entered into the record as though I read it in its entirety. Today, it is recommended that the annual report addressing management audits and management efficiency investigations performed by the Commission's Bureau of Audits during the 2022-2023 fiscal year be released. The auditors found that the companies that were audited could achieve annual savings of $36.5 million and a one-time savings of $13.5 million by implementing the management audit recommendations. The Bureau of Audits is an important regulatory arm of the Commission, and I would like to commend the Bureau for identifying these efficiencies. This annual report is an example of our system of utility regulation working. The good work performed by the Bureau of Audits has the potential to result in savings placed in the pockets of utility customers. Therefore, I am pleased to support the recommendation to make the annual report public. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page two and matters presented by Acting Director Hafner and the Office of Special Assistance, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the informal investigation by the Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement versus the Mifflin Energy Corporation. Is there a motion to approve the staff recommendation? Coleman, so moved. Is there a second? Barrow, second. Motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Any discussion? Chair DeFrank, I do have a statement. Vice Chair Barrow. Thank you. I would like my statement entered into the record as if I read it in its entirety. And I will try not to read it in its entirety. On April 9th, 2020, a natural gas explosion occurred in Waynesboro. It destroyed a residence and severely injured the home, a homeowner. The service line running from a natural gas well to the residential customer failed. These are what we call farm taps. Mifflin Energy, the owner of the well, now enters into a settlement to pay a civil penalty of $100,000 to resolve this incident. Mifflin Energy no longer owns the facilities. They've sold to a company called Mifflin Energy Resources. The, the petition states an unaffiliated company, notwithstanding the names. And we are publishing this settlement in the PA Bulletin for comment. I just want to point out that whoever owns the facilities in this case, the commission is still obligated to ensure that the facilities are safely managed. And I would expand that our BINE has concluded that farm tap facilities that are designed like the facilities at issue here are subject to the commission's authority to enforce federal safety regulations. INE has relied on a letter of interpretation from FEMSA in making in coming to this conclusion. Not only do these facilities have to be reviewed to ensure safe service, but the new owners also should conduct a comprehensive review of their facilities to prevent another such incident. All operators with farm taps need to ensure that facilities which are their responsibility are well maintained. And when modifications are made to farm taps, like what happened here, the facility owners need to reevaluate whether the modifications were installed safely. I ask all natural gas drillers in PA who are supplying gas to landowners with farm taps to please use this incident as a prompt to review the design and the operational safety of their facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any further comments? I do have a statement and a conflict statement. 
First, before joining my staff as legal counsel, Stephanie Weimer was employed by the Commission's Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement and worked on this investigation. Please note that she has not advised me in this matter. And for my statement, I ask that my statement be entered into the record as though I read it in its entirety. Today, the Commission votes to publish in the Pennsylvania Bulletin the proposed settlement entered into between the Commission's Bureau of, of Investigation and Enforcement and Mifflin Energy Corporation involving a natural gas explosion that occurred on April 9, 2020 in Waynesburg, Greene County. The incident resulted in the destruction of one residence and the owner of that residence sustaining second degree burns. Fortunately, there were no fatalities as a result of the explosion. The Commission's action today sets a deadline of 25 days from publication in the Pennsylvania Bulletin for interested parties to file comments concerning the proposed settlement. As discussed in the opinion and order, since INE's investigation into the incident was initiated nearly three years ago, Mifflin Energy's operating assets have been sold to a new owner, Mifflin Energy Resources, LLC. As Vice Chair Barrow stated, despite the similar name, Mifflin Energy and Mifflin Energy Resources have no affiliation or relationship. Furthermore, the terms of the settlement note among other things that since Mifflin Energy has sold its operational assets to a new owner that has no affiliation with Mifflin Energy, the parties agree that the remedial measures that would otherwise be sought and potentially imposed upon Mifflin Energy are no longer applicable to Mifflin Energy as the sale of these assets relinquishes Mifflin Energy from falling within the definition of a pipeline operator and accordingly Act 127's pipeline operator requirements are no longer applicable to Mifflin Energy. However, Regardless of who is the current owner of the facilities involved in this incident, the Commission is still obligated to ensure that all necessary remedial measures are taken to ensure that an incident like this never happens again. A better understanding of this issue of who is responsible for any remedial measures is necessary before determining whether the proposed settlement is in the public interest and should be approved. This is particularly true given the potential devastation associated with every natural gas explosion. We are fortunate that this incident did not cause any fatalities. However, we must ensure that we are doing everything possible to prevent such incidents from ever occurring, regardless who the current owner of specific facilities are. Therefore, I invite any interested party to submit comments on this issue. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing at the bottom of page two, it is recommended that the commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the petition for reconsideration regarding the Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement versus Great American Power, LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved, surface. Is there a second? Second, Barrow. Motion made by Commissioner Zerfus, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Any discussion? Chairman, I do have a statement. Vice Chair Barrow. Prior to working for me, Lori Moore was employed by BCS and she uh, was involved in this investigation. She has not advised me on this matter. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page three, it is recommended that the commission adopt <clears throat> in an omnibus motion both items on page three, beginning with the petition for reconsideration filed in Matthew 4G, care of Megan Forgey versus the Pico Energy Company and ending the omnibus with the tariff supplement and rate proposal filed by the Philadelphia Gas Works. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? In order so moved. Is there a second? Coleman second. Motion made by Commissioner Unora, seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 
The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page four, it is recommended that the commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the application of Amazing Care Home Health Services, LLC, TA Dependable Medical Transportation Agency. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved, Barrow. Is there a second? Second, surface. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Is there any discussion? Uh, Chairman, this is Commissioner Coleman. I do have a motion on this matter. Commissioner Coleman. Thank you. Before the Commission for Disposition are the preliminary objections of Amazing Care Home Services, LLC, to the joint protest filed in response to the application for a certificate of public convenience. I believe that the preliminary objection should be denied and the initial decision issued by the presiding administrative law judge be adopted and the application dismissed for failure to comply with the commission order. Amazing Care has filed an application with the commission seeking a certificate of public convenience for authority to transport persons in portions of Pennsylvania. Several certified motor carriers filed a joint protest to the application requesting that it be denied. The matter was assigned to the Office of Administrative Law Judge and the applicant was notified via pre-hearing order to have an attorney enter their appearance on behalf, on its behalf by December 27, 2022. The applicant did not comply with the preliminary hearing order. However, I note that our applicant did not, I'm sorry, I, however, I note that our OALJ was contacted by the law firm on behalf of the applicant on January 24, 2023, and the firm was advised to have an attorney enter an appearance at that time. After waiting several weeks for this to happen, the ALJ issued the initial decision on February 10, 2023, that canceled the formal telephonic hearing and dismissed the application for failure to comply with the pre-hearing order. The applicant was directed to file any exceptions to the initial decision by March 1, 2023. An attorney entered an appearance for the applicant and requested an extension of time in which to file exceptions. The initial decision became filed pursuant to final order entered on March 15, 2023. On March 17, 2023, the commission sua sponte entered an order rescinding the final order and directing the applicant to file exceptions within 30 days. The applicant instead filed preliminary objections to the joint protest. The preliminary objection did not identify any error in the initial decision or request that it be modified or vacated. I do not believe the commission should exercise its discretion to regard the failure for the file exceptions to the initial decision. The commission's rescission of order was prompted by applicants' request for an extension of time to file exceptions. The, pr the proceeding was essentially reset to a point at which the initial decision was issued. Instead, the applicant filed a pleading that was no longer available under our regulations and that no request of waiver of those regulations was proposed. The commission may dismiss a formal filing for the failure to comply with the orders regarding the filing of exceptions. Additionally, and consistent with section 332H of the Public Utility Code, the initial decision should become final by operation of law due to the absence of timely filed exceptions. Accordingly, I will move that the preliminary objections be denied, the initial decision of February 10, 2023 be adopted, and the application dismissed. The applicant may file a new application for certificate of public convenience for the requested authority. Therefore, I move the preliminary objection of Amazing <coughs> Care LLC DA Dependable Medical Transport Agency be denied. The initial decision of Administrative Law Judge Christopher Pell be adopted and the application of Amazing Care LLC DA Dependable Medical Transport be dismissed at this docket mark closed and that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an opinion in order consistent with this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. We've heard the motion by Commissioner Coleman. Is there a second? You know a second. Motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. On the matter as amended by the motion, is there any further discussion? 
Hearing none, is there any objection to taking the previous roll call? Seeing none, the matter passes as amended by, a mo by the motion by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing at the bottom of page four, it is recommended that the commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the petition for reinstatement filed by New Beginnings Moving and Hauling LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So move surface. Is there a second? Second, Barra. Motion made by Commissioner Zerf is seconded by Commissioner Barrow. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page five, it is recommended that the commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the formal complaint of Colby Simpkins versus the Pico Energy Company. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved, Barra. Is there a second? Second, Zerfus. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Any discussion? I do have a statement on this matter. I ask that my statement be entered into the record as though I read it in, in its entirety. In this matter, Colby Simpkins filed a formal complaint with the Commission against Pico Energy Company, alleging that Pico is threatening to terminate or has already terminated his electric service. Mr. Simpkins indicated that he disagrees with his total outstanding balance amount of $7,767.12. He requested a determination as to why his bill is so high, as well as the payment arrangement. Pico filed an answer to the complaint and the matter was scheduled for an evidentiary hearing. The pre-hearing order and hearing notice were sent to the email address provided by Mr. Simpkins in his complaint. Mr. Simpkins did not appear at the hearing. In her initial decision, the presiding administrative law judge dismissed the complaint based on Mr. Simpkins' failure to appear and offer any evidence to support his complaint. The, compa the complaint was dismissed without prejudice. 15 days following the deadline to file exceptions, Mr. Simpkins mailed a letter labeled as exceptions decision. The commission served a late file letter on PICO and established a deadline for PICO to file a response. PICO timely filed a response to Mr. Simpkins' letter. Today, I am voting to support the staff recommendation, which treats Mr. Simpkins' late file letter as a petition for rescission to the initial decision and grants the petition. Provides Mr. Simpkins with 20 days to file a written request for another evidentiary hearing and remains the matter to the Office of Administrative Law Judge if a written request for an evidentiary hearing is timely filed. Or dismisses the complaint without further action if no written request for evidentiary hearing is timely filed. While I'm voting to support the staff recommendation, I do not believe that providing the complaint with an additional 20 days to file a written request for another evidentiary hearing is necessary. The facts in this case differ from previous cases that the commission has recently considered involving a number of pro se complainants whose complaints were dismissed with prejudice upon failure to appear at scheduled hearings. They were provided with an additional 20 days to file a written request for another evidentiary, evidentiary hearing. In those matters, there was a belief that the due process rights of these pro se complaints were violated because the complainants did not affirmatively, affirmatively agree to receive documents from the commission by email. The facts in this proceeding, however, distinguish this case from the others. First, Mr. Simpkins' complaint was dismissed without prejudice. Therefore, there is no barrier to Mr. Simpkins bringing forth a new complaint even beyond the 20-day time frame. Secondly, the fact that Mr. Simpkins filed a letter, albeit late, to the, to the initial decision, which was served by email, distinguishes this case from prior cases where there was no indication that there has been any successful contact with the complainant. Mr. Simpkins' late file letter in response to the initial decision reflects actual notice of commission service by email. Therefore, while I am voting to support the staff recommendation, it would have been my preference not to modify the initial decision, which dismisses the complaint without prejudice. Are there any further comments? Chairman, this is Zerfus. Commissioner Zerfus. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make some brief bench remarks. Um, but with all due respect, I think we might have a disagreement on whether, on what Mr. Simpkins' letter is or isn't. But be that as it may, globally speaking, to set the table, I think I just want to be clear that going forward, if the commission serves complainants via email that they did not affirmatively select or agree to, it is defective notice and we didn't meet our obligations under the law. And to properly cure a violation, we need evidence of actual notice, meaning date and time of the hearing. But I do want to commend the Office of Special Assistance for identifying the defective notice issue in this case and properly applying the Hoyt uh, decision given the cir similar circumstances. I think this is an example of how our administrative process works and how it works for the people. I strongly support the staff recommendation in the case without modification, including giving, giving Mr. Simpkins the opportunity for a new hearing if he so chooses. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zerfus. Any further comments? Uh, Chairman, this is Commissioner Coleman. Um, I, I do Coleman. have a comment. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with the uh, the facts as you have articulated them in this case, and I think there are uh, several pieces, as you've indicated, that do distinguish this case from others that we've had before us. Uh, I have come to a different conclusion, and my conclusion is I agree with you. I wish that this uh, recommendation had been modified as you had proposed, and therefore I will be voting no on the, uh, on the staff recommendation. Thank you. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no? No. No. The ayes have it by a vote of three to two, noting the dissents of Commissioners Coleman and Yonora. Madam Secretary. Continuing on page five, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the informal investigation by the Bureau of Investigation Enforcement versus the Duquesne Light Company. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved, Barrow. Is there a second? Second, Yonora. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Is there any discussion? Chairman, I do have a statement. Vice Chair Barrow. Prior to joining my staff, Lori Moore worked in BCS where she advised um, on this investigation. Please note she has not advised me in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page six, it is recommended in an omnibus motion that the commission adopt both items on page six, beginning with the application filed by Umar Rafu and ending the omnibus with the application filed by ANK Luxury Car Service LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendations? Coleman, so moved. Is there a second? Second, Vera. Motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page seven, and matters presented by Director Diskin and the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, it is recommended that the Commission adopt in an omnibus motion both items on page seven, beginning with the application filed by Mittel Cloud Services and continuing the omnibus to include all three items on page eight, both items on page nine, both items on page 10, all three items on page 11, both items on page 12, both items on page 13, and both items on page 14, ending the omnibus with the letter of notification filed by Mid-Atlantic Interstate Transmission, LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendations? So move, surface. Is there a second? Second, Barra. Motion made by Commissioner Zerf is seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 
The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page 15, it is recommended by Acting Executive Deputy Chief Counsel Screven and the Law Bureau that the Commission adopt the proposed order in the petition filed by Boomerang Wireless, LLC, doing business as N-Touch Wireless. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? In order, so moved. Is there a second? Coleman, second. Motion made by Commissioner Unora, seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page 16, and matters presented by Chief ALJ Rainey and the Office of Administrative Law Judge. It should be noted that the first item on page 16, the formal complaint of Ann Urata, Goal versus Aqua Pennsylvania Wastewater has been postponed to the public meeting of October 19th, 2023. Continuing at the bottom of page 16, it is recommended that the commission adopt the initial decision of ALJ Brady in the formal complaint of Victoria Whitaker versus the Philadelphia Gas Works. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So move surface. Is there a second? Barrow, second. Motion made by Commissioner Zerfus, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman, this is Commissioner Zerfus. Mr. Zerfus. Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary, I have a motion in this matter. Please add it to the public rec record as if I'm reading it in its entirety. I will try to be brief. I'm not sure how successful I will be. On September 30th, 2022, Victoria Whitaker filed a formal complaint against Philadelphia Gas Works PGW. In the complaint, Ms. Whitaker averred that PGW is threatening service termination and that she would like a payment arrangement. The complainant also alleged that her outstanding balance should not include a balance transfer that occurred in 2018. On October 24, 2022, PGW filed an answer with New Matter. In its answer, PGW admitted that it issued a shutoff notice for the gas service at the service address. In its New Matter, PGW averred that the portions of the complaint regarding the 2018 balance transfer are barred by the statute of limitations within our code, section 3314, which provides that no action for recovery of penalties or forfeitures or any prosecution may be maintained unless brought within three years from the date the liability arose. PGW requested that the complaint be dismissed. Also on October 24th, 2022, PGW filed a preliminary objection to the complaint. In its objection, PGW reiterate its argument that the portions of the complaint regarding the 2018 balance transfer are barred by the statute of limitations under the code and should be dismissed. At the start of the scheduled hearing, the administrative law judge noted that PGW had filed a preliminary objection to a portion of the complaint based on its statute of limitation arguments. The ALJ then ruled on the preliminary objection granting PGW's request to dismiss a portion of the complaint. Accordingly, the ALJ determined that the arguments of the complaint pertaining to the transfer of the balance in 2018 would not be heard. Thereafter, the hearing moved forward on the consideration of the complainant's request for a payment arrangement. In the initial decision issued on May 25, 2023, the ALJ provided the rationale for granting the preliminary objection pertaining to the argument that Ms. Whitaker's outstanding balance should not include a balance transfer that occurred in 2018. Referencing the section 3314 of the code, the ALJ stated that the date at which the alleged liability arose is older than three years and therefore is barred by the statute of limitations. The ALJ concluded that section 3314 of the code divested the commission of jurisdiction to hear the complainant's action on the balance, which is the reason he struck the issue at the outset of the hearing. The remainder of the initial decision addressed Ms. Whitaker's request for a payment arrangement and the ALG, excuse me, the ALJ dismissed the remainder of the complaint. I agree with the ALJ's dismissal of the portion of the complaint pertaining to the request for a payment arrangement. However, I disagree with the granting of the preliminary objection on the statute of limitations argument. Rather, I believe the ALJ had the authority to apply the four-year statute of limitations provision pertaining to requests for refunds or credits under section 1312 of the code. Thus, I submit that the ALJ should have permitted the presentation of evidence pertaining to the transfer of the service balance in 2018 because it occurred within four years of the filing of the instant complaint. 
This matter is similar to prior commission decisions in which we have determined that the application of Section 3314 of the Code is misapplied. In the reasons for her complaint, Ms. Whitaker alleged that the bills of the previous owner should not have been passed on to her as the new owner and that the amount she owed was much less. In other words, Ms. Whitaker requested removal of the balance of the previous owner and essentially a credit for the arrearage of the prior owner. Under these circumstances, and consistent with prior commission precedent, it would have been appropriate under the authority of this section 1312A of the code for the ALJ to permit the presentation of evidence pertaining to this balance transfer occurring within four years of filing the complaint. Without the presentation of evidence related to the transfer of the prior owner's balance, there is no evidentiary record for the commission to determine if the transfer of the balance to the complainant was appropriate or if the total arrearage owed should be adjusted or reconciled as alleged. I submit that this matter should be remanded to the Office of Administrative Law Judge for the limited issue of determining whether PGW properly transferred the account balance to the complainant in 2018. So therefore, I move that the initial decision of Administrative Law Judge F. Joseph Brady issued on May 25, 2023 is modified consistent with this motion that the preliminary objection of Philadelphia Gas Works is denied consistent with this motion, and that the proceeding is remanded to the Office of Administrative Law Judge for further proceedings as deemed necessary related to the limited issue of the balance transfer occurring in 2018 to the complainant's account for the issuance of an initial decision on remand, and that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an order consistent with this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We've heard the commit the motion by Commissioner Zerfus. Is there a second? Second, Barrow. Motion made by Commissioner Zerfus, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any discussion on the motion? Chairman, this is Commissioner Coleman. I do have a statement that I'd like to add to the record as so I read it in its entirety. Thank you. Mr. Coleman. Uh, I'm just going to add that statement to the record. I won't uh, won't belabor the point this morning. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Any further discussion? Hearing none, is there any objection to taking the previous roll call? Hearing none, the matter passes as amended by the motion by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page 17. It is recommended that the commission adopt the initial decision of ALJ Buckley in the formal complaint of Jennifer Potora versus UGI Utilities. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? In order, so moved. Is there a second? Second, Barrow. Motion made by Commissioner Unora, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing on page 17, it should be noted that the second item on page 17, the formal complaint of Nikisha Leach versus the Philadelphia Gas Works has been postponed to the public meeting of October 19th, 2023. Turning to page 18, it is recommended that the commission adopt the recommended decision of ALJ Pell and ALJ Collins in the tariff supplement and rate proposal filed by UGI Utilities Electric Division. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved, Barrow. Is there a second? Second, Zerfus. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Is there any discussion? Chairman, I do have a, a verbal statement. Vice Chair Barrow. This settlement proposes a pilot program to automatically enroll non-shopping customers who receive LIHEAP into the utilities customer assistance program. We received varying opinions uh, from commenters regarding that proposal. I do see the value in automatically enrolling eligible customers into a utilities cap program, reducing administrative barriers for vulnerable customers to receive assistance that they are eligible to receive. 
However, I also recognize that there are potential problems that could be borne by low-income customers if they don't understand the rules and requirements of the program. UGI's obligation to properly educate customers who are automatically enrolled in CAP about their responsibilities as CAP customers is significant and the educational efforts must be prudently designed and implemented. Um, this, this proposed settlement contemplates a variety of safeguards built into the automatic enrollment process, such as enrollment into the CAP plan most advantageous for the customer, opt-out provisions for customers who do not wish to participate, data collection to monitor the success and potential drawbacks, customer education about enrollment in the CAP, and most importantly, the opportunity for one utility issued payment arrangement for auto enroll customers who accrue arrears while enrolled in the program at the average bill rate after the customer leaves or is removed from the cap. Through this, this proposed settlement, UGI is obligated to convene a collaborative to assist in setting ground rules for the administration of the program. The utility is also required to to provide updates to its Universal Service Advisory Committee, the USAC, to, to monitor the data points and determine whether adjustments to the pilot are necessary. It is essential for this program to be properly administered, monitored, evaluated throughout the pilot period. Our, our BCS staff will be monitoring the pilot program closely and, and will be sure that the utility addresses any concerns with the program raised by either the USAC group or in UGI's next universal service and energy conservation proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Is there any further comments or discussion? Uh Chairman, this is Commissioner Coleman. I do have a statement. Commissioner Coleman. Thank you. And I'd ask that my statement be under the record as I read it in its entirety. Um, I first want to uh, echo the concerns that Vice Chairman Burrow has mentioned this morning that I don't believe that rate case is the place for these types of modifications. Um, with that being said, let me, uh, let me get into my, um, my, com my prepared comments here this morning. Uh, before the Commission for Disposition is a recommended decision approving the settlement filed in the base rate case of UGI Electric. The settlement includes numerous modification to UGI's Electric Universal Service Program. Most significantly, as we've heard, the settlement provides that UGI Electric will conduct an interim pilot to automatically enroll non-shopping customers who receive LIHEV grant into the Customer Assistance Program. The settlement further provides that when the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services notifies that LIHEAP Advisory Committee that it is ready to share LIHEAP participation income data with utilities, UGI Electric will begin to implement the required modifications to its IT system and processes within a reasonable time frame so that the company may utilize the DHS data to automatically enroll non-shopping LIHEAP recipients into CAP and or recertify their income and eligibility. I think in that statement itself that is fraught with peril, that there are a number of moving parts here, and that's, uh, that is where my concern is this morning. Based upon my review, I would modify the settlement to remove both the interim pilot and the continued use of automatic enrollment supported by DGS data sharing. I am not persuaded that these proposals are lawful and reasonable, and they also appear to be in conflict with the policy position recently adopted by this commission. In addition to my concerns about the lawful and reasonableness of the certain provisions of this settlement, I am becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the modifications of universal service programs within base rate cases, especially in base rate cases that result in black box settlements. Despite my concerns, I find the majority of the settlement to be in the public interest, and therefore, I will vote to adopt the recommended decision. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Any further comments? Chairman, just Commissioner Yudora, I'd like to associate myself with Commissioner Coleman's statement. Thank you, Commissioner Yudora. Any further comments? Chairman, uh, I 
do have uh, a, a brief comment. Vice Chair Barra. Um, Commissioner Coleman, I acknowledge the concerns that you raised regarding the proper venue for changes to universal service plans. Um, these plans have a, a rate impact. Um, and for that reason, I'm, I'm not terribly opposed to modifications being made in rate cases. But, but I do hear you about the potential lack of transparency if these kinds of changes occur in a rate case that results in a black box settlement. I do hear you on that. Um, but So something I, I think the commission should probably start thinking about, and not just the commission, the utilities and the advocates, is the structure of our universal service proceedings. Um, my issue historically, and just my personal issue with those is that they are somewhat informal. And when we're talking about a program that has real rate impact, I don't know that I'm 100% comfortable with making really large decisions in the universal service proceedings. Um, I think there's a solution, um, you know, whether it's, it's in the rate case or whether it's in the standalone universal service proceedings. Um, just something for everyone to think about and hopefully we can continue that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the recommendation, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. It should be noted that the final item on page 18, the formal complaint of Kristen Flaherty versus the Duquesne Light Company has been postponed to the public meeting of October 19th, 2023. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the regular agenda. Turning now to the carry-in. On page one of the carry-in agenda, it is recommended by Executive Director Barrier that the commission ratify the appointment of David Screven as Chief Counsel of the Law Bureau. Is there a motion to approve the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Yonora. Motion made by Commissioner Yonora, seconded by Commissioner, sorry, motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Is there any discussion? Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words, uh, offer my congratulations to David. Um, for those of you, uh, David has been, for those of you who do not know, David's been serving as acting chief counsel for a number of months now. He's uh, been um, placed with some uh, tough uh, issues uh, before him. Um, you may have read about a few of those recently in the newspaper. Um, David, uh, I'm happy to work with you, happy to have you on board, and uh, looking forward to, to working with you in the years to come. Congratulations. Anything else? Hearing none, all those in favor of the recommendation, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, that concludes all agenda items to be considered today. Before we adjourn today's meeting, I would like to recognize Commissioner Coleman, who I understand will present remarks concerning PHMSA's evaluation of the PUC's pipeline safety program. Commissioner Coleman. Well, thank you, Chairman. And it is a delight this morning to be able to report out on our uh, US DOT PHMSA report card this year. And uh, first of all, I want to shout out to Director Kanaski. Uh, who leads our Bureau of Investigation Enforcement and that uh, investigation enforcement, and that's where our gas safety division is located. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Rob Herensky, who leads our gas safety team. Uh, these guys do a remarkable job, and uh, I just can't thank them enough for uh, 
uh, the hard work that they, they do each and every day to keep us all safe here in Pennsylvania. Uh, so here's the good news for this morning, that uh, this is the, the annual report card from PHMSA. So they come and spend um, two different sessions with our team over uh, four days. And so it's not just a in the office going through files and looking and seeing what the team has been up to, but they actually spend time with our gas safety inspectors. They're out in the field with them, and uh, they, uh, they do a full top-to-bottom look at how we're performing here in Pennsylvania. So uh, I just want to read this one section out of the letter that was, uh, was sent to the chairman back on the 13th of the month. I think this pretty much sums it up. It's PHMSA conducted our annual evaluation pursuant to section 60105-E and 60106-D of Title 49 of the United States Code which authorizes PHMSA to monitor the state pipeline safety program. The annual evaluation is designed to ensure compliance with the Pipeline Safety Act requirements and to provide information that will allow PHMSA to determine the state's total pipeline safety grant score for the upcoming year. PHMSA has assessed uh, the Pennsylvania gas pipeline safety program and scored uh, 50 out of a possible 50 points for the Pennsylvania PUC gas pipeline safety program and the hazardous liquid pipeline safety program. So a perfect score for our gas safety team. And uh, again, I just want to commend them this morning for doing a great job here in Pennsylvania. So thank you, Rick, and thank you to our gas safety team. Thank you, Thank Chairman. you, Commissioner Coleman. Any further comments? Uh, before, we would also like to take time to recognize Hispanic Heritage Month. And with that, I turn to my colleague, Commissioner Zerfus, for her remarks. Commissioner Zerfus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just yesterday, I had the pleasure of participating in Pennsylvania's sixth annual Latino convention, one million strong, to help celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. I joined other state leaders, advocates, and students to discuss all aspects of Latino life, community, policy, and agenda in order to empower, educate, and celebrate our communities. Each year, this is a special time for us in celebrating the rich and diverse culture our Latino community gives us here in Pennsylvania, which many of you know has seen rapid growth, and the community stands, as I said, over a million strong. Latinos are proud, pr profoundly excuse me, impacting our democracy, culture, economy, and workforce. The nonprofit energy organization Hispanics in Energy noted that Hispanic Americans represent $2.8 trillion, and that's trillion with a T, of gross domestic product and would be the fifth largest economy in the world. But that same report also noted that there's a scarcity of Latino CEOs representing America's energy companies, and far too Latinos are underrepresented in STEM energy occupations. So as a regulator of more than 9,000 entities and an employer of more than 500, the Public Utility Commission is keenly sensitive to these issues. And we sh should understand that historic population growth of the Latino community should complement the expansion and progress of the energy industry. So I encourage you to join me in recognizing Hispanic Heritage Month, which we will celebrate through October 15th. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zerfus. Now, uh, I want to honor two of our long serving team members who are leaving the commission. First, I'd like to recognize Vice Chair Barrow uh, to make some comments uh, about Joe Whitmer. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, today, I wish to recognize my longtime colleague and friend Joe Whitmer for a long and productive career. Joe began at the commission when he was hired by Cheryl Walker Davis and Russ Albert, my prior, my first bosses in the Office of Special Assistance as an attorney to in March of 93. In his most recent role at the commission, Joe served as counsel to former chairman Gladys Brown Dutrop. Joe was never shy about sharing his passion and focus on preserving universal service to telecommunications and expanding internet service to all of Pennsylvania's underserved and unserved rural and urban areas. 
He prepared the recommendation in the multi-fiber systems, original chapter 30 case, a case that opened local telephone service markets to competition well in advance of the Federal Telco Act of 96. While he's been known for his primary emphasis on telecommunications and broadband, Joe was also involved in some influential commission work over the past 30 years. He was lead attorney for the rulemaking that implemented the securitization of billions of dollars in stranded costs connected with Pennsylvania's electric restructuring. He was the lead author on the original policy statement governing gas supply and customer choice before the later Pennsylvania statute implementing customer choice for gas customers. He inherited and completed a final rulemaking on chapters one, three, and five of the um, of our regs, resulting in ERC approving a rulemaking related to filings and appeals. Joe did this work over the past 30 years while working in the Law Bureau, the Office of Special Assistance, and as legal counsel to former Commissioner Aaron Wilson Jr. and with former Chairman Dutral. Joe's been staff chair for Telco at MacRook and is currently staff chair of the staff sub subcommittee of the telecommunications committee at NARUC. He's worked extensively with other state public utility commission staff in the states and territories and, and also internationally. Um, Joe's the proud recipient of the inaugural Ray Baum Award from NARUC presented to state telco staff in recognition of his work advancing the public interest of Pennsylvania and all the states in telco and broadband. During his time here at the commission, Joe's provided um, numerous presentations and, and taught on um, spread his expertise. He has expressed that out of all of his professional accomplishments, he is most gratified to have worked with former Chairman Dutrell on facilitating the mapping and bidding that resulted in Pennsylvania receiving over 266 million for bidders to rebuild broadband networks in unserved areas. The implementation of a wireless equipment distribution program through Pennsylvania's TRS program so that visual, speech, or hearing challenge Pennsylvanians can get equipment to communicate and getting NARUC to adopt a resolution that would keep about 66 million in federal support for broadband in PA for bidders later disqualified by the FCC. Joe studied political science at Susquehanna University, the University of Detroit, Mercy School of Law, Northeastern University in Boston, and Harvard's University Extension School. He and his partner, Ed, have lived in Camp Hill for more than 25 years with their indoor koi pond, four turtles, goldfish, and Ed's ever-changing yard sculptures. <laughs> of all their personal accomplishments, they are most gratified for having been foster parents to multiple children, opening their home to his nephew, Dominic, who went on to graduate from Albright College, and having a son, Rain Theodore Ashton Kenyon, with most recently their grandson, Everett. He and Ed are patron subscribers to the Metropolitan Opera in New York and the Harrisburg Symphony. He loves attending their performances, going to London, reading the New York and London reviews of books, and attending rock, jazz, and R&B concerts. During his retirement, Joe looks forward to volunteering for archaeological digs for Lucy's Bones in East Africa <laughs> and in Israel maintaining their gardens and decluttering the house, catching up on stacks of unread book reviews and taking the Wednesday Amtrak train to Manhattan for matinees. Joe, you will be missed, and we wish you the best as you begin your well-deserved retirement. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. And um, 
Joe, I wish you all the best as well. Again, I wish I can be there with you in person um, to congratulate you as you embark on this next chapter. And although my time working with you um, was short this 11 months, uh, this past 11 months, I do uh, appreciate our talks, uh, you know, as you and I were probably the only one left in the office uh, before the lights turned out. So um, with that, I'd invite you to the podium if, if you'd like to say a few words. Well, um, frankly, I'm, I'm going to thank everyone, uh, Chairman DeFrank, Vice Chairman Barrow, Commissioner Zerfus, Commissioners Coleman and Yonora, uh, for giving the opportunity to speak today. I, it's been a fast 30 years. It seems like it was about 12 years, but it's really been 30. Um, and I really did prepare a few remarks. They're not, um, they're not long because I'm all that stands between um, me and Chairman Dutrell and the reception welcoming the, the, the new commissioners and the new vice chairman and the new chairman. So I'll keep my words very short, uh, very, very brief. Um, I had prepare, prepared remarks because I'm good at issues and I'm good at facts. But when it comes to talking about my personal life um, and me, that's a very difficult subject because it, it's, it's just difficult. So, so I shortened my comments since Kim said many of the things that I intended to say and thank you uh, because you did recognize the people who were very important and instrumental in my life, uh, particularly Cheryl Walker Davis uh, for bringing me back to Pennsylvania. You know, we're, you know, I'm a seventh generation Pennsylvanian and two descendants fought in the revolution. So I don't need anyone to tell me what the revolution is about. Um, I, I, and you may wonder, like, where is my passion coming from? Well, you know, Alexander Pocock, in the Machiavellian moment, said that the founding of the American Republic was the last great act of the Renaissance. The Renaissance was all about knowledge, a belief that every human could reason, and equality, and science. And that, in turn, led to the founding of the American Republic. The American Republic which started here in Pennsylvania, for those who, who may not know it, um, was premised on the proposition that we could govern ourselves and that we did not need an aristocracy to govern for us because we couldn't do it ourselves. Um, and that in turn generated what Barbara Ward called in her book, The Rich Nations and the Poor Nations, an agricultural abundance that gave rise to industrialization. Um, and it wasn't always shared equally with everyone. Many of the people involved with that industrialization and the agricultural abundance uh, contributed far more than they, they returned. So, but the process was the founding of the Republic was premised here in Pennsylvania on the idea that we could govern ourselves. It gave rise to an agricultural abundance that gave rise to economies of scale that were needed so that more people than not who voted were comfortable, they had lights, heat, gas, water, and communication systems, because that's what you need for an industrial civilization, and more people than not have to have it, otherwise you don't have a republic. So those two factors is what led to, ultimately, in the course of time, the creation of monopolies because of economies of scale and the scarcity of capital, and the Public Utility Commission, and these five commissioners are involved every day in deciding how that will be done. And it is a delicate balancing act between private ownership of production because of the generation of wealth that it creates, and then the allocation of uh, the benefits of that production and that wealth because it stabilizes a democracy and frankly, in my view, uh, preserves our republic, particularly when it comes to my passion, which is making sure that everyone has access to that knowledge on the internet because the internet is the library of today. And those who think otherwise, I think, are, will pay a very high price. So <clears throat> between Barbara Ward and Paul Pocock, that is really where my passion comes from. Um, I respect um, the delicate balancing of interests here that occurs every day. And it doesn't matter whether someone is delivering the mail or it's an industry person who has just filed a huge document that exceeds Rosemary's digital download capacities and has to be mu downloaded multiple times. And then there's a discussion about where will it go? And then who will hear the case? Who will object? What will you, will you decide? And then 
Will it be appealed? Um, and ultimately, everybody involved in this, whether it's the consumer, the industry, the consumer advocates, the public interest advocates, the staff, the commission, we are all involved every day with balancing the wisdom of Solomon, frankly, every day in every decision and everything we do. That's a, that's a big obligation. And we are charged, I think, with maintaining the industrial civilization that is necessary uh, for a democracy and a republic to continue. And that is where my passion comes from. I would like to thank not only Cheryl, but John Povolatis, who moved me to the Law Bureau, Buck, who let me do telco, Frank Wilmarth, who signed off my recommendations, even though he probably didn't like them and still doesn't, um, <laughs> Kathy Sophie, who encouraged it and tolerated it, and she even put up with me when I came down to the Office of Special Assistance asking innumerable questions about innumerable things on behalf of the Office of the Chairman, um, or Commissioner Wilson, or whoever else I was working for him with at the time. So <clears throat> I really, I, that means a lot to me. Um, I, I, I particularly am grateful, frankly, to former uh, Chairman Dutrell and Vice Chairman Barrow uh, for working with you for 10 years. It was a great, great, great learning experience. I reinforced my belief in the importance <clears throat> of maintaining our industrial civilization, a republic, and making sure that everyone, everyone is welcomed and included um, because we cannot go forward without that. And for me, making sure that everyone has access to the internet, everyone has access to knowledge, everyone has access to science um, is so very important. And it wouldn't hurt to be able to stream the Met either, and let me tell you, all right, it's not so bad. Um, so those are the things I really want to say. Um, I'd like to thank my cousin Chris, who actually made it. Um, she has always been my favorite cousin under a certain age. She knows it. And, um, and I never, I'm not going to reveal the age now, but I've been saying to, it to her since she was a child, so she knows it. And my partner and now spouse, Ed, who was on his way, but something must have happened. So, well, there you go. Um, and um, He's here. Oh, all right. <laughs> so... <laughs> It is an all scripted, okay? Um, and uh, finally, I really want to thank my friends from my life. I have friends from high school who are here. I have friends from my college days who are online. Most of them live in DC, although Larry lives in San Diego. I have friends from my graduate school days who are now in Arizona, who used to accompany me to um, bookies and um, Lilies in Hamtramck where we listened to then unknown bands, punk bands like The Police and a gang of four. And um, finally, my friend Bob, from my law school, day, from my graduate school days in Boston, who and I went to an unforgettable Ramones concert down at the Channel, um, which is now a upscale industrial development. So things change. Um, I just want to thank you all, honestly, uh, for tolerating me uh, for 30 years. Um, and for Ed, for being there for 25 of the 30. And for those of you who made the wedding, it was a nice ceremony. It took me 25 years, but you know, good things take time. So at any rate, I want to thank everyone for this, um, for this opportunity. I want to thank you, uh, Chairman DeFrank and Vice Chairman Barrow. And you said it far better than I did about the things that I'm most proud of here at the commission. And I encourage everyone, in close, closing, I encourage everyone here to remember Every day, we are, we are advancing the Renaissance, and we are fighting for the Republic, and we, are, and we have to exercise the wisdom of Solomon in that delicate balance between private ownership and public oversight and accountability that preserves and makes the whole thing work. And it doesn't matter if you're in the mailroom or if you're the chairman of the commission or you're an industry lobbyist or you're a trade association person or you're the person who's just dropped off, you know, Five boxes for Rosemary's scan. So I, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So as, as you can see, um, for those of you who may not have known Joe that well, you can see why I enjoyed all those conversations uh, uh, after hours. <laughs> Um, so, Joe, please come to the front. Vice Chair Barrow is going to present you with a gift from the commission.
last but certainly not least, uh, we are going to turn to our former chairman. And personally, this, you know, when I came to this commission nearly a year ago, um, I knew I was going to be making a speech like this. I didn't know the day it was going to be, uh, it was going to happen because we didn't know, but I knew sometime in the future I was going to be um, making this speech. And, and this is bittersweet because I'm making this speech as a chairman and I appreciate that opportunity. But having that opportunity means my good friend is not serving beside me anymore. Um, so I'm going to give a few words about uh, our former chair and, and talk about her her career now. Gladys Brown Dutro has been an influential leader here at the commission for more than a decade, and her work on these issues in the state Senate stretches back decades. During her tenure here at the PUC, she's overseen an abundance of activity in all of our regulated industries and has led us through a pandemic. Initially joined the commission in 2013, she was appointed and reappointed by three different Pennsylvania governors. She was designated chairman by two Pennsylvania governors. Chairman Detrell has always drawn strong bipartisan support. We see that when we go across the street and watched uh, whether we were testifying in the House or Senate, saw part uh, members from both sides of the aisle um, show great respect uh, for our chairman. She reflected grace, compassion, and unwavering commitment to consumer issues in her time on the PUC. She steadfastly championed the commission's role in safeguarding the public interest and ensuring that all voices are heard in the important discussions about utility service. Chairman Detrell has emphasized a fair and balanced approach to utility and consumer issues, which are deeply interrelated. During her time at the commission, she offered a statement and outreach on social injustice issues and led the creation of a diversity policy statement and rulemaking. Chairman Detrell also initiated the commission's utility careers campaign supported consumer education from the 2013 polar vortex through the high energy prices we experienced in 2023 and served as a voice for consumers and for consumer protections in each and every case. We cannot forget her fearless leadership as she led the commission through the pandemic, including an initial period of daily all hands on deck operations call with senior management. During the COVID-19 emergency, Chairman Detrell made motions to initiate the termination of moratoriums and enhance consumer protections. In-house, she created a telework pilot program in 2019 and championed the creation of cybersecurity director position. She will be known for her strong focus and national leadership on grid reliability, critical infrastructure, and electric transmission. During her time at the commission, her focus remained strong on transportation issues as well, including bringing the process to bring Uber, Lyft, and other TNCs under PUC jurisdiction to benefit public safety, and offering a joint motion with myself to form electric vehicles working group and move towards electric vehicle rate design. She led this commission toward the implementation of legislation placing the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority under the PUC jurisdiction, one of the most sizable additions of PUC jurisdiction in decades. She also continued the Pennsylvania PUC's strong tradition of nationwide leadership in utility man matters, joining NARUC's board of directors, even participating in international mentoring programs through NARUC and USAID. In addition to her role on the board of directors, she'd also served on the critical infrastructure committee, along with NARUC's Emergency Preparedness, Recovery and Resiliency Task Force, which was created to explore utility issues related to weather emergencies and evaluate the national utility response to COVID-19. As part of that task force, she chaired the subcommittee on Black Sky events. 
Here in Pennsylvania, she led the creation of the Black Sky Working Group and the first ever Black Sky Exercise. Again, I appreciate her partnership and leadership. She worked me into some of those exercises earlier in the year to make sure that there was a transition from when she left to that expertise still maintain that experience, not expertise, experience um, still uh, take, uh, having place in the commission. She also served on the on first joint federal state task force on electric transmission. Additionally, she served as president of MACRU, working to address a diverse array of utility issues across a dozen states, stretching from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. Prior to joining the PUC, Chairman Detrell served as counsel to the Senate Democratic leader, where she worked on many of the major utility issues that have been considered by the General Assembly in the last two decades, including all the major deregulation bills for telecommunications, electricity, and natural gas. Act 201 of 2004, which added Chapter 14 to the Public Utility Code and changed the handling of consumer terminations and reconnections. Act 129 of 2008, which addressed energy efficiency and energy procurement. And Act 11 of 2012, which expanded the use of distribution system improvement charge. By the way, in addition to doing all that, she had to um, work with other staffers that uh, I'm sure cost her uh, a little grief at times. Not mentioning any names, of course. Before her work in the Senate, Chairman Detrell served as an assistant counsel to the Bureau of Professional and Occupational Affairs in the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Department of State and as a clerk for the late Honorable Paul A. Simmons, judge of the U.S. District Court, Western District in Pennsylvania. She is a native of Middletown, Pennsylvania. She's very proud of that, uh, that background. Chairman Detrell earned her bachelor's and law degrees from the University of Pittsburgh and is a member of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. She is also a member of the Dauphin County Bar Association, the James F. Bowman Inns of Court, and the Keystone Bar Association, and serves on the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank Governance Committee, following three terms on that organization's board of directors. As you are walking around the Capitol and you see the uh, Hunger Garden that's between the Capitol and the Ryan Building, Gladys Brown Dutrell was one of the founding members of that. And by the way, you know, when she started, it was it was, you know, not nearly as large as it is now. That's the kind of impact that Gladys Brown Dutrell has had not only on us here at the PUC, but across the street on the General Assembly as well. She is a active member of the Bethel AME Church in, Beth in Harrisburg and is also an active member of the Epsilon Sigma Omega chapter of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the Harrisburg chapter of the American Association of Blacks and Energy. It is an understatement to say Chairman Detrell has left big shoes to fill. Gladys, you will be greatly missed, but we thank you for your dedication to this commission and its mission as well as to our Commonwealth, and we wish you the best as you venture into your next chapter of life. Thank you. And before we honor Gladys, I would ask if any other commissioners would like to make any comments. Mr. Chairman, this is Commissioner Zerfus. Commissioner Zerfus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I think your remarks were just really great. And I would like to add some to the record as we celebrate Gladys Brown Dutrell today. But today is a bittersweet day. So not only are we saying farewell to Joe Whitmer, whom I'm going to miss, we're bidding farewell or see you later maybe, to our colleague and friend Gladys Brown Dutrell. So initially joining the commission in 2013, she was appointed as PUC chairman in 2015. This makes her the longest serving female commissioner and chair, the longest serving black commissioner and chair, and the longest serving chair in half a century. And that's not nothing. Her tenure in the commission is has marked only the third time in Pennsylvania history when two women have served together on the Public Utility Commission. 
Madam Chair has been an unwavering advocate for the most vulnerable members of our communities and stressed that utility service, be it energy, water, communications, and transportation, is a human right and a civil right. We have heard the list for many accomplishments, thanks to Chairman DeFrank, but that only touches the surface of what kind of legacy Chairman Dutrail will leave with the Commission. So in addition to her professional accolades, we all know that Chairman Dutrell is kind, she is gracious, extremely patient, and quite funny. Chairman Dutrell has provided me with a very warm welcome upon my nomination to the Commission, and I thank her greatly for becoming a remarkable role model for my time here, and I would like to thank her for being a positive role model for young girls everywhere, including my own children. Gladys, I thank you very much from the bottom of my, of my heart, and I wish you only the best on your next chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zerfis. Are there any further comments? So we have put together a very special. Hey, Chairman, I'm sorry. I uh, I was hesitating here. I thought maybe one of my other colleagues would uh, had something to say, but I. Uh, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. These are those moments as I'm I'm listening to uh, to Chairman DeFrank uh, going through just a a wonderful celebration of your career, Gladys. It, you know, it just kind of, you get a lump in your throat when you think about that than the years that we have spent on this bench together. And, you know, I, as Steve is running through the chronology, there's some of those events that uh, it stirs a very positive emotion. And then there are those events that it's like, oh boy, <laughs> those, those were some challenging times. You know, we think of, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we had during a polar vortex and trying to figure out what it is that we as a commission can do to respond to adverse weather conditions that have caused incredible financial harm to so many across this commonwealth. Uh, and we did so. I think we responded uh, uh, extremely well um, to that situation. Uh, we think of the advent of uh, transportation network companies, not only here in Pennsylvania, but across the globe. And uh, I think it's fair to say they did so with, uh, with uh, a fairly aggressive approach here in Pennsylvania that caused us to really pivot in the way that we do our business. And it caused the industry to really rethink uh, the way they operate, uh, not only here in the Commonwealth, but uh, across the globe. Uh, there are those, those moments in time where we took on new responsibilities, and under uh, Gladys's leadership, uh, we shined, and we did a fantastic job. And I think of you know, taking on a, a role that's not typical for this organization in collecting impact fees from the Marcella Shale industry. And we've collected billions of dollars that have been disseminated across the Pennsylvania for the greater good. And we did so, again, not a typical role for this organization, but we dispatched the team within this organization to be able to put together a very complex model and to be able to, uh, to collect the money and to distribute the money on a very complex formula in a very short period of time. So there have been some, some wonderful uh, periods of time and there have been those challenges. But, um, you know, as I was listening to Steve's remarks, I thought, well, what is, the, what is that, that legacy that, that you leave in this organization? And I think that in, in my mind, it is summed up as uh, I view you as the goodwill ambassador of this organization in all the places that you have touched uh, during your tenure here as this, at this commission, whether it is here, uh, within the commission, within the team, uh, within our individual teams, uh, whether it is with the, uh, the consumers that have various issues that uh, both Steve and Katie have talked about, and that you have had compassion uh, for their particular causes, uh, whether it's the legislature, in our oversight committees or whether it is uh, providing testimony representing the interest of this organization 
you have been the face and the voice of this commission. Um, and it's not just here, not just here in Pennsylvania. As Steve had mentioned, that it is with our uh, regional association and our national association where you have moved into leadership roles in representing the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I guess I would sum it up in that you've done it with such grace and dignity and compassion and dedication and confidence for what you have done in representing the organization. Uh, most importantly for me has been the friendship that has endured during our time together here at this commission. So I want to thank you uh, for all that you've done. And uh, I'm sure that this is not the last that we see of Gladys Brown Dutrell. So uh, thank you for a very celebrated career and for all that you've done for this organization. And please accept my very best in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Chairman DeFrank. Vice Chair Barrow. I wasn't going to say anything because you, you covered everything, <laughs> as did Commissioner Zerfus. But just very briefly, Chairman Dutral, you have been a shining example of what leadership looks like or should look like. Um, I think you sometimes drove us a little crazy because you never said no to speaking engagements, et cetera. But, but the thing that you did teach us in, in uh, never saying no, um, even if the topic was not something that was your passion or, or that you had had the opportunity to study before, was you are one of the bravest people that I know. You actually are. And that, that's one thing that wasn't mentioned. You are brave. And, and, um, and of course, everything else that everyone said, you're a fantastic mentor. I wouldn't be here without you. Um, and, and I know there are a lot of other folks working in state government and, and in private industry who, who can thank you for the same mentorship. So thank you. I wish you the best in retirement. Please get a little rest, just a little, just a little. And, and I know we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Chairman Frank, Gladys, what else can I say? Nora. What else can I say? Everybody already said it. Uh, I just want to thank you for your dedication and hope that you're able to take some time now and enjoy your life. Okay? And I wish you and your family all the best. Thank you, So we put together a special tribute video in honor of Gladys. And, and, you know, as you heard all of my colleagues speak to Gladys's amazing career, you're going to get a, a sense of how deep that career runs when you see some of the folks on this video. So we would like to share that with you now. Chairman Gladys Gladys Brown Dutrell. Chairman Gladys. Gladys. Gladys Brown Dutrell. Gladys, Gladys, Gladys. Gladys Brown Dutrell. <laughs> so Gladys, where do you start? Just so many good things. This is a bittersweet moment to say congratulations to Gladys after 10 years of service with the Public Utility Commission and eight years as our chairman. Gladys highlighted the commission's work to educate consumers and enhance the safety and reliability of utility services. You've been a, a great advocate for this.
this time, I would like to give our former chairman, Gladys Brown Dutrell, a chance to provide some comments. Gladys, please come up to the podium. Well, that was uh, a surprise. I know our, our communications, I'll still say our, I always feel like I'm part of the family. They kept telling me it was going to be a great video and a surprise, and I do want to thank them for that and also thank my colleagues. It has truly been a pleasure working with all of you. Um, I, I do want to say to Chairman DeFrank that you forgot to mention you had a, a, a partial suspension from the diva club. For I a didn't moment. forget that. We, okay. you, don't, you don't got to worry about that. We had to kick him out for a moment when he was there in the Senate, <laughs> but uh, we let him back in. So, but I just want to take the opportunity to, uh, there's a lot of thanks to go around. I know that when I was on the bench giving some of these remarks in terms of retirement, I always talked about family. And, and I am here standing with 35 years of service to the Commonwealth. So I, I have a lot of thanks to give because I felt that each step in the way of the way I was building onto my family. You know, I reminded someone, I forget who I was talking to when I came in, but I said, you know, I started in this building. It wasn't this building, but it was the building that was previously sitting on this site. And I started with the Bureau of Professional and Occupational Affairs under the Department of State. And when I left that job to go and clerk for a federal judge, I never thought I would be coming back to this building. I probably never thought I was coming back to the Commonwealth, but I always know that things happen for a reason. And I did come back. And I went on to serve my longest time period with the Commonwealth with the Senate Democratic Caucus, serving on their legal staff, serving as their deputy chief counsel, where I did meet uh, Chairman DeFranco. We did have a great time um, because we, we became the family. As we were working on so many important issues, there were so many things that we were able to discuss and put together as we pulled together and talked about things that would impact our term there was constituents, but impact the consumer and make it better for their everyday lives. I was honored to be nominated by then Governor Corbett for my first term here at the Public Utility Commission in 2013. And even then I kept saying I felt like I was leaving family because I was moving only right across the street because those, com those relationships that I built then were very important. And I kept those relationships because we continued to work for the same groups of people that we were trying to help, the consumers, all the way along the way. And during my tenure here, um, was honored to serve and be nominated as the chair by then Governor Wolf in 2015 when he came in the office and then also to be nominated to a second term uh, under Governor Wolf and then also to be named chair uh, when Governor Shapiro came. So I was just grateful for all the opportunities to ser serve, but all along the way, it was the building of the relationships. I had the opportunity when I came in 2013 to serve under Chairman Powelson, and you saw him in that video. And Rob and I, we got along well. I, I always would say to him, Rob, you went off script, and he knew what that meant. <laughs> but it was... The passion I always talked about with the different commissioners, Commissioner Whitmer was there with me at that time, uh, Vice Chairman Place was there, Commissioner Colley was there, uh, Commissioner Coleman was there the whole time with me. Uh, we had uh, Commissioner uh, Kennard that was there and uh, Vice Chairman Sweet. I'm trying to remember all the names. I don't want to skip anyone. And then, of course, our current commissioners, Commissioner Unora and Commissioner Zerfis and uh, Chairman DeFrang. And it just does my heart well to see Vice Chairman or Vice Chairwoman uh, Barrow to be sitting on the bench because Kim and I definitely served in so many different uh, or worked on so many different policy issues together while she served with me as my chief of staff through the time period that I was here at the commission. So I'm just so grateful for those relationships. I've constantly said, we may not have agreed on everything, but we know that there was a passion that was in each and every one of those commissioners that I named, and I hope I didn't forget anyone along the way, because we were here to serve the people. But also in terms of those relationships, that family that we built, it was also because not only of the family members that I gained when I worked in the Senate 
and still have relationships with and was able to call upon them whenever we were dealing with legislative matters or they wanted some input from us. But just as importantly is the staff here at the commission. When I came to the commission, I already knew a lot of the staff because of the legislative issues that I worked on. And I knew then the great impact that the commission staff had on policy issues and the great work that they did. So I, I leave the commission knowing that the commission is always in good hands because they have, pa they have staff that is very passionate, very dedicated, and committed to the needs of the consumers and also the mission of the commission, which is balancing those needs along with the needs of the utilities that the commission regulates. But I also want to recognize when I'm talking about family, my own family as well. And I know you can see some that are with me here today. Um, when I started on this path, I started as a brown. So I did a lot of different things within my tenure here. I, I think I can't remember if there's anyone that has gotten married as a commissioner, but I did. And so I'm happy to say that my husband, Stephen Dutrell, is here with me, along with his sister, Yvonne, here with me, and I thank them for coming. But I also want to give a special recognition to my two sisters who have been with me in every step of this 35-year journey. And that's my sister, um, Emma Pettis, my oldest sister, and my sister, Florence Abdullah, who's here with me today. And I want to thank them, because they were here with me through both nominations and confirmations. And, and I just want to thank them and let them know how much I love them very much and how they supported me throughout the years. I also have a great niece that's here with me, Dr. Amber Sessoms. And I have to say doctor, because she worked hard on that doctorate. I'm so proud of her and all she did. But it's the, the family that I they think of and I'm so appreciate, appreciative of because also outside of the working family, I have also members here from my sorority, uh, friends that I've created over the years. They're here to support me. I'm very thankful of that and different members of, of different organizations. So when we think of the jobs that we do, we're, we're so grateful for all the commitment of all the staff but more importantly, we're grateful for the friendships that we build over the years. And that's not something that I'm going to forget. When I walked out of the first building that was on this site, I remember saying, I never looked back. I never turned back to be nostalgic about the building. I was happy to go where I was going. But we always say God has other plans for us. And he made that complete circle and bought me back. And so when I leave here this time around, I will remember the lesson that I learned over these 35 years that I need to look back and remember the family that I created over this time. So thank you very much for the honor. Thank you for just showering love on me. Thank you for the hard work that we've done over this 10 years here at the commission. I will always remember it and appreciate all of you. Thank you. Gladys, as always, we have a special gift for you. If you would please come up, Vice Chair Barrow will present that to you. That concludes our meeting today. We ask that you please join us for a reception immediately following today's uh, meeting. Feel free to bring your goodies back into the hearing room to enjoy and also watch a slideshow of our former chairman's illustrious career. If there is no other business to come before us. Are there any objections to adjourning the meeting? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>